rice. Yes, sir, James. My lords, uh, the ICJ judgment. Yeah. The overall submission that we make is that it is on no view uh, uh, either undermining of the reasoning of the House of Lords in Bonku number two, upheld, as I will show you in a recent case concerning Cyprus and the sovereign base areas in Cyprus called Bashir, which went to the Supreme Court on whether the Refugee Convention continued to apply in those sovereign base areas. Nor, on any view we submit, it, does it support any case that the claimants were or are now within the jurisdiction for ECHR purposes. The finding of the ICJ, as you have seen having read it, was that it had been uh, unlawful as a matter of international law, I'm summarising, when giving independence to Mauritius to split off what then became uh, the buyout because that breached the principles of self-determination of Mauritius. And at the very most, and I make no submissions about whether this is going to happen, what the mechanisms are under international law, but I'm going to take it to its very highest for the claimants for the purposes of this argument. At most, therefore, Biot, if I can put it this way, goes back to Mauritius. And so I'm assuming all of that for present purposes. And there are, even on that basis, <coughs> highest for the claimants, uh, uh, three fundamental difficulties with the claim as they now seek to develop it orally. Firstly, a biot, the biot still became a new political entity in 1965 and no declaration under Article 56 of the ECHR was made in relation to it. And I emphasise that as the first point because if you just take up your authorities bundle and go back to Bonku uh, number two, behind tab five, the critical paragraphs for present purposes are paragraphs 64 and 65. And I'm going to them in support of the fundamental submission that, that I've made, which is that uh, even assuming all of those things about the new ICJ judgment, they don't undermine the reasoning that you see in 64 and 65. Can I just invite my lords to just cast an eye over those two paragraphs again? Yes. <laughs> and can I just give you the reference? Uh, you, you may not need it in its entirety, but if you want to look, by all means do, because it's in a separate file. In our separate little clip of documents, if you go to tab eight of that, you'll see the Bashir case, which was, which was about the sovereign base areas. And one of the arguments that was made in that case was to invite the Supreme Court to overrule precisely those two paragraphs. And the Supreme Court declined to do so but they distinguish them for the reasons that we will see. But if I can give you the reference to that, it's in behind tab eight of our bundle. And the relevant paragraphs for present purposes are 66. Sixty-seven. 
So 66 effectively is summarising the passages I've just taken you to. quoting Paragraph 64. 67, you see the invitation to overrule it on the basis of international legal principles, which they decline, but nevertheless on the facts, as you see from 69, they distinguish it. So just go back, if you would. Just do it just fine, just to see what yeah. it says at 67. This wasn't a case where the circumstances were identical to those relied on by Mr. Jaffe, where the uh, hiving off of what became the buyout was uh, unlawful as a matter of international law. It wasn't. It wasn't. But go back to Paragraph 64 and 65. The question is whether that finding of international unlawfulness in the process of decolonisation, I'm not going to keep repeating that, but my lords are well aware of the ambit of the dispute before yes. the ICJ, but whether that unlawfulness touches the reasoning that, ha that, that you see in the now hardened 64 and 65 of Bonku number two. And my submission is that it doesn't touch that reasoning. As you see from 64, at uh, 489 by the letter H, the sequence was that there had been a declaration under Article 56 of the ECHR in 1953. Now, at that stage, as you're aware, Mauritius, the old colony of Mauritius, comprised what we now know as Mauritius and the Bayot. Yes. And then what happened was that a new political reality emerged. The, the Mauritius Declaration that is, the old declaration lapsed, as they put it. That's the word they use at the, in the penultimate line on that page. They conclude over the page at 490A that the declaration, or declarations under Article 56, apply to political entities and not to land. And so the only question was, since 1965, when Mauritius became independent, was Biot a new political entity? Because if it was, no declaration had been made in relation to it. And they concluded it was indeed a new political entity. And the consequence of that was that the now lapsed previous declaration that had been applicable to the whole of the territory, that's now gone. I understand the reasoning, and, and, and uh, I think Mr Jaffe accepts that, but what he says is that reasoning... Uh, might uh, be affected if the uh, political entity created was one created as a result of a breach of international law. Well, my answer to that is that it wouldn't be touched. The reasoning precisely wouldn't be touched because it is fundamentally dependent and simply dependent upon whether or not there is a new political entity in respect of which... Legal or un... Legal or unlegal. Uh, however, however the process, however the lawful or unlawful, however the process was actually done, you have a new entity. So the old declaration is gone because it's lapsed on Mauritian independence. That's completely gone. And now you have a new body that sits outside that yes. and is on any view, certainly as a matter of domestic law, but is on any view a new political entity, however it was created and whatever species of international unlawfulness there may have been in relation to that. So that's the first point. Yes. The second point, and I suspect this may have been what was in my, my law's mind when asking me the, that last question, uh, uh, the, the second point is, if the unlawfulness were to be undone, what would happen on the ICJ's reasoning? Well, the answer to that is that because the process of decolonisation wasn't undertaken properly, didn't respect the self-determination of the Mauritians, the answer is that it would the UK administration would cease, 
not getting into all sorts of controversial areas about how this takes effect yeah. in international law, but I'm taking it at its highest, I emphasise, and it would go back to Mauritius. So the buyout would effectively go back to Mauritius. And they would then, that is Mauritius, new Mauritius, yeah. would then be exercising administrative and governmental functions for the buyout. But that doesn't help him. That cannot help these claimants to say that his clients are now, as a result of this ruling, within the jurisdiction of the UK. And it can't help them precisely because on that scenario, which is the highest it could possibly put on the ICJ, be put on the ICJ judgment, they would be under the jurisdiction of Mauritius, not of the UK. And they would no longer even be considered to be within our international relations responsibility, which is the precondition for exercising the Article 56 power in the Convention. And of course, that doesn't help them because Mauritius is independent now. The declaration made in relation to it has lapsed. It is not a signatory to the ECHR. And it would be for Mauritius to decide whether or not to resettle what rights of protection to establish and so on. So the fallacy is the conflation, as it were, of the kind uh, Mr. Jaffe seems to suggest flows from the judgment, the conflation between the rights of uh, Mauritians with the rights of Chagossians against the United Kingdom. But the fact of the matter is that if you take the ICJ at its highest and you apply a maximum remedial possibility to it, it gets him to a place which is less acceptable from his perspective, from the perspective of, or, or in the context of a jurisdictional argument. So whether you approach it on the basis of my first point, the logic of Lord Hoffman is not touched, or on the basis of the second, we'll take it at its highest, what would happen? Answer, it would all go back to Mauritius, and that wouldn't help him. It doesn't get him anywhere near or nearer to what he actually needs to do, which is to establish jurisdiction in the United Kingdom flowing from the logic or reasoning of the ICJ and this judgment. And that leads on perhaps to the third point. Uh, they're all to some extent interrelated, of course, but how does the argument work as an issue of interpretation? And again, my lords already have all the points that we've made about this being an advisory opinion, ours being a dualist system, this is international law and so on. But how would it actually work as an issue of interpretation? And Mr. Jaffe's answer to that was to say, well, sometimes uh, the Strasbourg Court has regard to uh, international obligations uh, and international instruments sitting somewhere even below international obligations uh, as support or assistance in interpreting convention rights. That's how he puts it, the Demir and Turkey line, which I'm sure you've both come across on a number of occasions. So that's how he puts it. And then that prompts the question, well, what's he interpreting in the light of this ICJ judgment and to get where? And his answer to that was to say, well, you look at Article 56. And what he said was that Article 56 must now be interpreted, in inverted commas, I'm not sure there's any case which suggests that Article 56 attracts that principle in Demir and Turkey, but leave that, leave that on one side. Um, he says that Article 56 must now be read in this way. You can make, you the government, the state, the signatory state, can make declarations for and only for those for whom you are properly and lawfully responsible under international law. So that's the interpretive spin he puts on it. That's, that's the punchline, as it were, of, of all of this. But just think for a moment how that would work. We made, that's the UK made, one declaration, and we did so in 1953 for the old compendious colony of Mauritius, as you've seen from Lord Hoffman's judgment, and that lapsed on independence. So that declaration has gone and hasn't been resurrected. It is a fact that there has been no further declaration. And that's why they were arguing, as they were in Bonko, about it, it having continued in some way. Um, uh, but the point is, not that we've made some unlawful declaration, which might sound in his interpretive point. 
it's that when the new political entity was created, no declaration was made. And so he has to assert that in some way the ICJ unlawfulness creates a positive obligation, is the only way it could work. So this is the point my Lord put to it. Yes, it's a positive, perhaps it was, I'm not sure if it was, I'm, and I'm labouring it, I apologise. But it's a, it's, a, it's a positive obligation to make a declaration is the only way it could work. But his answer, I think, is, isn't it, that um, this whole line of argument shows for him that Article 56 isn't operative because, um, if he's right, uh, it doesn't count as a territory for whose international relations the UK is responsible. So we're in the territory, sorry, that's the wrong word, we're in the area of um, de facto occupation, which is Article 1. But then, it, but, but, then, but, then, but then he has to say that Article 56 has been in some way, shape or form disapplied by the ICJ judgment, and we know it hasn't. We know from Chagos Islanders that the, 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 the position in relation to that is that Article 56 plainly does apply in that sort of context. And that's not going to be altered by an unlawfulness or otherwise in the, in the run-up in the, in the, of the decolonisation process when we were negotiating with what became the new government of Mauritius. I thought they didn't cite the point in the Chagos Islanders. Well, my lord, you've seen you've seen what they said about 75 and the arguments of principle, 73, 74, 75, and they decided on other grounds. But but in any event, what to the extent that might be authoritative, that too would have to be considered in the light of the ICJ opinion, which at that point hasn't been decided. My lord, it would, and then and then I get back to my points one and two. But the, 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 perhaps the, the significance of point three is perhaps that it what you can't do is to put it the way that it was originally put, which is to say, well, you have to interpret Article 56 in that way. You have to say that in some way, shape, or form, this judgment, and because of the unlawfulness identified, would have the effect of disapplying Article 56 in relation to a, a territory over which the UK did assert responsibility for its international relations and continues to assert responsibility for its international relations. Now, if in some way, shape or form, in the future, one gets to the stage where administration responsibilities are passed over, in fact, then the world may be different, but that will depend upon the real politic of international relations. As at today, and as at all points relevant to this claim, Biot is a territory over which the United Kingdom government asserts International legal responsibility, international relations res responsibility, and, and nothing in the ICJ judgment alters that. The finding of unlawfulness may have consequences down the line, which alter that in fact, but they hadn't ar arisen at the, at, at the point that this claim was decided, and they haven't arisen to date. And it may be that they will never arise. I don't want to lose sight of, but I know we are focused on the consequences of unlawfulness and this route in, but I, I don't want to lose sight of all the points that we've made in our um, objection to permission about the nature and scope of what they were actually considering and actually deciding in that case in the ICJ. Colonisation, the process of colonisation, directly focused on UK relations effectively with Mauritius. That's why it's an advisory opinion, because normally when two states go to war in the ICJ, there has to be consent. <laughs> That's why you have it as an advisory opinion, because it yes. came from the UN through that route, so someone had machinated it to get it into the court via that route. And you have all the points about international law not simply becoming part of domestic law. Um, so that's that. Uh, the only other area I was going to touch on was ECHR simpliciter, i.e. leaving aside the ICJ argument. Yes. And you, and you uh, want to make some very short points in relation to that. I'll try very hard not to repeat myself because our fundamental submission is that the divisional court were correct for the reasons they gave. One, Bonku, two, binding. Two, 
nothing to support the case that was mounted in front of the Divisional Court, and I think again here, which is that that's been overtaken by uh, uh, the developments in the Strasbourg case law, including in particular Al Skaney. And so far as that is concerned, the conclusion of the Divisional Court was that, on the contrary, uh, there was nothing to provide support for that proposition. And, if anything, the case law since Alskany uh, stood for the opposite proposition, which is that they reached the same judgment. I don't need to go back to, I know you already have it in mind, 73, 74, 75, and so on. All of those, those arguments, the, perhaps the bull argument of principle, the key argument of principle being that it can't be, can't have been the intention of uh, 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 states when signing up to the convention, including Article 56 or 63, as I think then was, um, uh, it can't have been their intention to create parallel schemes of jurisdiction, because in circumstances in which Al Skaney type jurisdiction is made out. Um, uh, 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 you will almost always, or when you're in Article 56 territory, you will almost always have that set of circumstances. I well, that was a very good argument for deciding on scaling the other way. I mean, it's very hard to reconcile the Alskaney approach to jurisdiction with the, with the Article 56, which recognises jurisdiction as a legal concept. Well, unless one says that Article 56 effectively provides a, 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 an alternative an alternative cutout, as it were, so that the states can actually decide, and it's the states that decide, they can actually decide which parts of their territories for whose international relations they are responsible will or will not fall within the more of the ECHR. Now, of course, that may or may not, in other circumstances, um, preclude jurisdiction if you invade Cyprus or do whatever you do, but uh, the fact of the matter is, if you are dealing with that sort of situation, if you're dealing with Article 56 and you've made that declaration, it would be very surprising if it was the intention of the drafters of the convention if you could simply come back and say, well, there we are, it's now been overtaken by some parallel jurisdictional scheme and that means nothing. And whatever my Lord may think about the logic or purity of that argument, the fact of the matter is it looked pretty attractive to the Chagos Islanders' court. And, and it wasn't as though this was en passant. You will have seen from the Divisional Court's judgment that one of the things that was considered in Chagos Islanders uh, was whether or not to revisit their earlier decision in quark fishing in the light of Alskany and to overturn that and effectively in the light of Alskany. And they said, no, no, we're not doing that. And we're not doing that because Article 56 has this separate, this separate function. So that's the second point. The third point is there was indeed an interesting debate, perhaps a, 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 an overly theoretical debate, which I've no intention of, of succumbing to the temptation of engaging in here, because it led to all the dramas about whether a concession had been made. But there was a prolonged theoretical debate about whether or not, in certain circumstances, despite Article 56, jurisdiction might nevertheless uh, be established. And that debate, as you can imagine, descended quite quickly into and would need to consider distinctions between the Crown acting in right of the UK and the Crown acting in right of Bayot, all those sorts of arguments they considered in quark fishing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, and the short for the purposes of permission answer to that, is the one that the Divisional Court gives in the final sentence of Barrow 143, which is, that is not this case. Here we have a, 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 a decision which is not remotely like those anxious invasion or someone's military forces going out and torturing people cases. We're just not in that territory. And also those were the submissions I wanted to make. Thank you. That's been very helpful. Uh, now, uh, even in a permission hearing, I think you have a right of reply, but it is very constrained just to those points. Yes. Is there anything you want to say? Um, just on those three points alone. Um, the, last, the last three. Yes. Yeah. Um, so James's first point was that BIOS had become a new political entity um, to which no declaration was made. Well, of course, accepting that that may be right, and that, of course, was the decision in Bank Court number two, um, that doesn't take into account the new fact, which was that the detachment was unlawful, and the additional step 
which the government invites the court to take is to give that unlawful detachment effect in public international law to remove fundamental rights. And that's why this case is a very different case from the facts of Bashir. Because what happened in Bashir is there was a dispute which dealt with the issue of whether or not a new political entity was being created. So Cyprus, the colony of Cyprus, the sovereign base areas were carved out of um, Cyprus when Cyprus was given independence. And were the sovereign base areas a new political entity? Um, and the Supreme Court said no, they weren't. And so therefore the ratio of Bank Court number two did not apply and the convention continued to apply to the sovereign base areas. So that was the issue, and it was decided on the facts in a different way to Bank Court number two. It didn't raise the issue which is, I submit, now before the court, which is what do you do in a situation where the detachment was unlawful as a matter of international law. Um, so James, the second point was that the case um, doesn't work because what would happen is that the Chagos Islands would go back to Mauritius in the future. Well, of course, that's right. But now, the United Kingdom, taking the ICJ's opinion at its highest and on its on face value, the United Kingdom is unlawfully controlling and administering the territory. And my claim is based on Article 1 jurisdiction. Well, no objection to the, to the Chagos Islands being handed back to Mauritius in due course, but at the relevant time when this decision was made, um, the United Kingdom was in effective control for the purposes of our scheme. And then the third point made by Sir James about how this case works as a matter of interpretation. The issue, which I invite the court to consider, is whether or not this is truly an Article 56 case or whether it's an Article 1 case. And what really makes the difference, in my submission, is that the continued administration of the Chagos Islands is unlawful as a matter of international law. So the United Kingdom is not properly and lawfully responsible for the international relations of the Chagos Islands. So article, an Article 56 declaration is not an option. And the reason why I raise that is because normally it's presented as a binary option. You can have a choice between Article 56 or Article 1. And if Article 56 is properly available and the state has a choice to make a declaration relying on Article 56, then you can't use Article 1. That's the argument that's put against me. I say that argument isn't available after the ICJ's advisory opinion uh, for the simple reason that the United Kingdom is not properly and lawfully exercising administrative control over the international relations of the Chagos Islands. I absolutely accept Sir James's point that de facto the United Kingdom is doing so, but de facto in the sense of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, not lawfully as a matter of international law. And in my submission that does make um, a practical difference. Um, unless I can assist there, that there's a my fine. Very well. Um, thank you all uh, very much for succinct and clear submissions. I think unusually, in the case of a uh, permission application, we are going to reserve our decision, but not for very long. Uh, I won't tell you exactly when it's going to be handed down, uh, but it will be soon. Uh, I think it would be prudent um, to consider some consequential matters if we do give permission, but please do not take that as a hint. It's simply that if we do, it will be um, tiresome to have to review these matters on, on, on paper. Uh, on the worst case assumption from the uh, Secretary of State's point of view that permission were given on all grounds, uh, well, perhaps I come to the, the, the uh, the end point first, but I'll do it since I've started. It seems to us that the uh, correct estimate will be one of three days. If we were to give permission on other grounds, on fewer grounds, we would adjust accordingly. Uh, do any of you have any strong views about that? Three days might be on the on the long side, but uh, courts uh, never mind cases running a bit short. Whereas it can be tiresome, especially an important is to have to um, telescope them into uh, an inadequate estimate. I will take silence as consent to a three-day estimate on that. Um, we have all, assuming that uh, permission is given on uh, the ECHR ground, I think um, 
Mr Jaffe accepted uh, that uh, it would be formally necessary and would also be a useful discipline for the grounds of claim to be uh, amended to uh, reflect the point based on the ICJ opinion and uh, for the uh, same thing to happen though no doubt using essentially the same language to the grounds of appeal uh, and if we had given permission, if we do give permission on this point, that would really include um, an amendment uh, to reflect the argument as now advanced. Uh, the parties would probably anyway wish, in a case of this sort, to reconsider or to put in revised skeleton arguments, and they would in any event ought to, to cover the uh, ICJ point if permission is given covering that. Uh, and uh, it seems to us the shape would then have to be uh, that uh, fresh skeletons were served within a reasonable timetable and the timetable for the Secretary of State skeleton postponed so that you could be responsive to those. Uh, if we give permission uh, and subject to anything any of you may want to say now, we would hope the parties should draw an order giving effect to something along those lines. Uh, is there anything else that on that hypothesis is likely to be necessary in the order? Doesn't sound like it. You can always come up with something. It should be useful to canvas it now if there was. Uh, very well. Um, as I say, uh, we will. We haven't actually decided whether we will do an oral hand down or something in writing, um, but whichever it is, you'll be given adequate notice. Uh, thank you. All right.